Welcome to the Money and Wealth Show, brought to you this week by AmericanManganeseInc.com. Here's your host, Sterling Fox. Welcome to the Money and Wealth Show, where each week we offer you opinions on business, the economy, and finance. This week, it's a real pleasure to welcome back to the program a woman who has a lot of opinions on all of those topics. Danielle Park is with us back from Ontario and Venable Park Investment Council. Hello. Hi, Sterling. Nice to have you back with Thank us. Thank you. We should also right off the top mention Danielle's blog, jugglingdynamite.com, a place on the net that I find myself visiting uh, several times every week. Danielle, we made it through April Fool's Day, so congratulations to both of us. Uh -huh. The country has made it through April Fool's <laughs> Day. And here we are with an election uh, on our plate, and not too far down the road either. The economy is what the government would like us to all be considering first and foremost. Do you think Canadians are there? Um, I think real Canadians, like everyday people, are quite concerned still about the economy. I think, it, it, I think that the election is seen more, at least in the circles that I've sort of had a chance to talk to, as an inconvenient, uh, expensive thing to have that won't really accomplish much and won't really take us toward economic stimulus, which people are still worried about. So we're in deficit financing uh, with a vague promise in the budget a few weeks ago that we will have a balanced budget by 2015-16, which seems rather a remarkable feat of mathematics. If indeed they're able to pull it off, we'll all be the better off for it. Do you think that's possible? Well, I hope it's possible, but I'm not really optimistic about that. I know they've used somewhat conservative estimates in coming up with the, the idea of how much growth we should see and therefore how much we should be able to have in the revenue side. But I think that we are, again, overestimating what the next few years will look like, and particularly for Canada. I think we've come through this sort of... Um, uh, the last couple of years better than everybody else, yes. or most, as, as everyone's been very proud to say. I think that now that we have increased domestic issues, uh, namely mass cr consumer credit, uh, lack of optimism, and still a fairly shaky job market in Canada, I think people are starting to feel more vulnerable, and I think we're going to see that that isn't going to be the wind beneath the sails as we go forward the next couple of years. And then if we get into a period of global, you know, tepid growth even, even what we've had but maybe a little slower, which we can talk about, I think Canada might underperform the next couple of years and that's going to set that timeline back. Well, uh, one of the main arguments that's going to be made by all parties during this election campaign obviously is how best to bribe us with our own money. We have this fatal character flaw in Canada. We seem to like that. So social programs are going to be front and center. We offer this, says one party. We offer you this plus, says another party. All of which, Danielle, as you continue to point out in your blog, is based on deficit financing. Mm -hmm. It's all borrowed money. Right, and nobody in the free world, never mind Canada, but let's just talk about Canada, has confronted the aging dem demographic of our population, the horrendous health condition of our population as we get older, and never mind the older people, the younger people as well. The health care costs, the entitlements that we have in place are simply staggering. Mm -hmm. When you look at the dynamic of how many taxpayers are coming behind the baby boomers and how we're going to pay for all that. So I just think we haven't even cracked that nut yet. And they're, they're talking about, you know, things like an extra guaranteed income supplement for right. old people. You know, obviously I don't have a dispute with that. There's a lot of people in, in the, you know, above 50 bracket in Canada today that are living fairly hand to mouth. Mm -hmm. Sad state of affairs. Um, and so those government programs are going to be very much needed. But at Beyond that, you know, I just think we have to reallocate some of the spending expectations that we have, as well as uh, increase things like retirement age and probably have more pay user fees in the in the healthcare system. The idea that everybody gets everything they want for free and multiple times with no accountability on the individual, I think, is not a good model, and we'll probably come to see that over the next few years. The chickens will eventually come home to roost. Well, you know, it's math. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, that's what it boils down to. It's, it's basic math. That's it, yes. And it just doesn't add up, and yet we seem quite prepared to ignore those numerical realities, don't we? Well, and the credit bubble, let's face it, allowed people to ignore a lot. 
But in the post credit bubble phase, which Canada, as I say, is really just entering. We are. Because yeah. in the last couple of years, we were still in the credit bubble. Now we're coming out the other side of that. And I think, again, as our real estate market starts to weaken, um, you know, which is certainly happening in the U.S. It's full on double dip again in the U.S., yes. right? Um, 25, people have 25% less wealth today in the United States than they had three years ago before housing took such a major downturn in the stock market, et cetera. And Canada's about to see that we have a lot of our, quote, paper wealth or wealth on paper in our housing, which is now in decline as well. So. All of those issues, I think, are going to be a bit of a challenge for us as we go forward. You're a pretty level-headed person with a good grasp of global economics, and you just mentioned the terrible downturn in the housing market in the United States, now in its sixth year. Yep. Could such a calamitous downturn occur in Canada in a similar way? Well, what we know about real estate cycles is they tend to be about 15, 10 to 15 years in length. So we had an appreciating housing market in this, in this country for the last 15 years, really. That's a very long one. And it was extended, as I say, by doing things like lowering the borrowing standards, right? Bumping out the amortization, interest only payments suddenly became available and the lowest interest rates in 100 years, of mm -hmm. course, Sterling. Mm -hmm. All those things let people sort of um, keep the housing cycle going longer this time. So we know that we should expect a period of all 10 or so years where housing underperforms now. That's just what history tells us. And so we can do that in a couple of ways. You can think of a 1980s style decline uh, or perhaps like a 1990 style decline where really it wasn't as severe at the outset at the front end but really it didn't go anywhere for about 10 years. So I think you know we're something like 25 percent overvalued on Canadian real estate on average. It's worse in certain sector uh, sections of the country and the question is you know will that sort of have a, a couple of down years and then slowly build back out or will it be a more protracted you know just going nowhere for a much longer period of time. Our guest this week on the Money and Wealth Show, portfolio manager and investment advisor, Danielle Park from JugglingDynamite.com. We're back with more after this. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. American Manganese Inc. has a world-class deposit in Arizona, indicated 6.7 billion pounds, inferred 8.9 billion pounds, potentially the lowest cost producer of electrolytic manganese. American Manganese Inc. has a projected cash cost of 44 cents a pound. The metal trades near $2 a pound. Do the math. Trading symbol AMY. Visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 604-531-9639. You're watching The Money and Wealth Show, archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Here's your host, Sterling Fox. Welcome back to The Money and Wealth Show, in conversation with Danielle Park from Venable Park Investment Council in Barrie, Ontario. Back out on the West Coast for another visit with clients. And Danielle, you and your clients are concerned most these days, I would suspect, about capital preservation rather than investing on the market for profits here there and everywhere it's not that time is it well um i don't think it's that time but people are definitely interested in income um it's not that easy to uh, stay out of risk assets even if you're concerned about volatility and downside at the moment because cash is still paying next to nothing mm -hmm. on purpose right that was the whole idea of QE was to make cash rates virtually nothing so that we would all go long risk and uh, as a result if you decide that you don't want to be long risk right now you're being penalized and you're suffering on the income side as well so yes I think you know my preference is capital preservation at the moment but at the same time the question is you know how does a person fund their life when valuations are overstretched again and fixed income rates are very low and cash rates are virtually nil. It's not an, it's a very challenging environment right now. A few minutes ago you talked about the Canadian housing market being uh, generally speaking valued at roughly 25 percent over where it should be. How about the stock market? Is there a number that you can apply? Is there a similar ratio going on or is it more balanced? Oh I don't think it's balanced. I think it's a pretty crazy market at the moment. Um, 
first of all, from okay, if you look at it from fundamental valuations, in our in our work we use technical as well as fundamental valuation tools to try and get a sense of you know what investment thesis you can make about different assets. Okay. So if you use the sort of typical valuation metrics on a fundamental basis, whether it's the Canadian stock market, international, or US, they're all suffering from the same QE disease, which means they've all overshot to the upside. They're trading at valuations that are something in the area of between, depending on the metric you're using, something in the area of 20 to 50% overvalued. Um, and here's the thing that's most important about that. We are at peak earnings again in terms of, uh, because of we had such a, uh, a devastating um, downturn where companies slashed their, uh, their expenses, laid everyone off, downsized, really hunkered down to get through the, the 2008 big, big decline. So what happened was when the, when the economy ramped back up again, sort of on the QE juice starting in March 2009, the cost structures were so lean mm -hmm. that margins jumped very quickly. All right, so now if you look at a chart of those uh, profit margins today, you find that we're actually back almost exactly where we were in 2007 in terms of the best and highest profit margin growth you've seen uh, in, in a, in, since 2007. Okay. But here's the thing. The, Current growth rate is something like three point thir sorry thirteen point three percent earnings growth is about where we are right now. But the long term average for that metric sterling is about eight. Oh, okay. So we're way overshot in terms of the likelihood of continuing at this pace. Because here's the thing: people can't conduct their business to you know more and more orders on skeleton staff indefinitely, as an example. And so on the one hand, we're saying hopefully there's enough demand that people will start hiring again. Exactly. And bring people back in but that is a mean reverting aspect to earnings in other words corporations can't continue to earn at this pace because their cost structure goes up not only that the commodities inputs have gone way up and you're starting to see that impact earnings reports right now as they're coming out are more and more in the line of uh, actually our costs have gone up substantially right and so therefore I think that people who are saying the stock market's cheap not only are they using you know strange metrics to get that, but also they're using record earnings and and sort of projecting that to continue, which I think is a very dangerous thing because history tells us of all the things we follow that uh, once earnings are that much over over the mark over the average, they always mean revert, and that's the problem with the stock market today. Not that we have to have a recession, although I think we might, but I'm not saying we have to. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that even with some growth. You know, we got uh, a Q4 a confirmation of uh, GDP for the U.S. recently uh, at 3%. Uh, that was with all the stimulus. Right. 3%. And that was before all the outbreaks in the Middle East. That was before the Japan quake. You know, that was before oil doubled. So if we look at all those things now, I have to be concerned about certainly the next couple of quarters and maybe the whole year in 2011. And yet we hear about a long-term bull market in commodities and uh, led mostly by China and India and their growing economies and their demand for what you like to call our rocks and trees. And as long as that demand is out there, there are a lot of people in Canada quite willing to bet and, and gamble with the, their betting money uh, in the stock market that this is just going to go on indefinitely. Yeah, well, you know, if you're a foolish sort of person, you might think that it would. But if you look at any kind of historical input, you would say that it doesn't. And even in a secular bull in commodities, which we have been in for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. has had enormous volatility. Sure. And in fact, it always has. If you look back at the last secular bull in commodities in the 60s and 70s, you know, you put up a chart of some of those key things like copper, incredible volatility, right? Which is what we saw in 2008. And what I like to say to people is, China and India have a pretty st static amount of demand. They're a growing population, certainly, and they've stockpiled some stuff, et cetera. But they're also in a stop phase at the moment, too. Right. And they have, now we see inventories start to come out. You know, people that had been stockpiling start to bring things like copper back on the market. So there's interesting, I put a chart of copper on the blog recently. And it's actually below support now of the rally that started from March 09. Let me just uh, interrupt because I, I want to remind people that Danielle's blog is jugglingdynamite.com, a terrific place to visit. 
Terrific homework happens on that website. Hopefully, like this program, you can learn a lot by visiting that website. We're back with more here on the Money and Wealth Show after this. The Money and Wealth Show is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Molycore Gold Corp has substantial assets. Magnesium deposit, inferred 52 billion pounds. Molybdenum deposit, indicated 1.9 million tons. Inferred 1.8 million tons of 0.087% MO. Past silver producer, average 182 ounces per ton. Trading symbol, MOR. Website, mollycore.com. Or phone me, Larry Ray, at 604-531-9639. You're watching The Money and Wealth Show, archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Here's your host, Sterling Fox. Welcome back to The Money and Wealth Show. Our special guest this week is Danielle Park, Portfolio Manager and Investment Advisor from Venable Park Investment Council in Southern Ontario. Danielle, just before the break, you were talking about the stock markets and the secular bull market in commodities and so on. There's one other thing about the stock market that I hope you can help us understand, and that is this super hyped up trading activity level that's been quite noticeable lately that, of course, everything's computer driven now anyway, so that accelerates the process. But now we're talking about a hyper accelerated trading process. What's going on? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of things, I think, that have undermined the integrity of the stock market in the last couple of years. One has been an erosion of sensible regulation, and the other has been just basically uh, lack of police, lack of anybody sort of watching. Now, that's partly because the regulatory agencies like the SEC have been dramatically underfunded. Mm -hmm. I, I think perhaps on purpose, because the financial sector likes people to look less, and they sort of call the shots with the lobbying. But in fact, what we found is in the last few years, uh, and especially especially in the last couple, Sterling, we've had um, the rally that's happened since March 09 has been anemic in volume pretty much throughout. Uh, that has been something that we have been concerned about, okay. okay. Volumes have not been supporting this dramatic r rally that we've seen, and that's usually a problem. All the textbooks on technical analysis tell you volume needs to support trend, and it, it hasn't been. Okay. But if more than that, the volume that's there has been very bizarre. It has uh, features like um, most of the monthly gains are made on the first day of each month. Mondays are almost always a positive day. Um, and this is correlations that make no practical sense in a free-flowing market. But these are scores that we can follow in the papers every week. And there's this pattern that you're, you're pointing out that is repeatable and, and repeating rather and very identifiable. And that's why a lot of us are going, so what's really going on here. And I think the resilience in the face of really negative news of late, and it's not big resilience, it's like the stock market goes up 60, per, 60 points every Friday. Sure. And sits there. The Dow will sit there at 62 points, so 67 points. There's something strange about that. And I think one of the aspects of it is this high frequency trading, which is an embarrassment. It should be banned. It is not something that provides value of any kind. You know, the proponents of high frequency trading who are making billions on it, by the way, essentially are transacting things on the, the public exchanges that's uh, a, so a blink is 300 uh, uh, milliseconds to okay. take okay 300 uh, these transactions are taking place in less than seven so they are not perceptible to the human eye they are incredibly rapid and this is sort of a, a front running almost of regular investment houses regular investors so this has been going on for quite some time it's only recently that a couple of agencies like the SEC have sort of done some investigation. And the proponents of it are all saying, oh, but we lower the bid-ask spread and we provide liquidity to the market. But you know, in reality, they don't provide liquidity in any meaningful way because as we saw in the flash crash, what happens is a lot of the trades that are rapidly going faster than anyone can see are actually canceled. A recent study by CFA Institute uh, cited some reports lately where they found that 96% of the trades that are putting through in this process and therefore showing up as activity are ultimately canceled. Interesting. So, Somebody's playing games. Well, 
we know exactly who, who's doing it. It's actually a sanctioned, condoned process at, the, at this point. There's a whole bunch of shops that are set up within a block of various exchanges, like the New York Stock Exchange, because there's a locational bias. If you're that close, you actually get the, the information just slightly faster, and then you're using this incredibly high processing uh, equipment. So this is an embarrassment to free markets and, and general principles of equity and transparency. There is no argument one can make that this is a good thing. And yet it's been going on. And not only that, it makes it more dangerous for anyone that's trying to use these markets in the manner in which they were supposed to right, be right. used, which is to bring, you know, a public capital based on trust into a system that supports the evolution of uh, economic growth and companies who are able to go and hire people. This is the legitimate economy and the stock market is supposed to be facilitating the legitimate economy. This is an illegitimate practice. It's farcical, it's dangerous to the rest of us, and it undermines the public confidence. That was my point. That was where I was coming to with all of this, because we've always known, all of us, no matter how much or little we engage with the markets, it truly is a playing field not for the faint of heart. So, okay, that's an understanding we've all come to. But with this sort of hyperactivity going on and this shady manipulation in the background by people literally with billions at play, I mean, a lot of people just go, you know, I don't want to play on that field, and I'm kind of tough. I used to be able to go out there, but that's not for me anymore. Are you finding that with your clients? I'm finding that people are extraordinarily skeptical, and I think they have every right to be. And then at the same time, public pensions and people with their retirement savings are supposed to be, listen to Mr. Bernanke, going out on the risk curve and, and you know, it's like Bill, it was like George Bush saying, go shopping to help the economy. He's right, saying, right. get out of your cash and go buy these stocks at these ridiculous valuations and hold on to them, do your part to help the economy. It's not helping the economy. It's helping a few richer people who have seen their values improve a little bit in their portfolios, but mostly it's helping these proprietary traders and the stock exchanges. You know, all the buzz lately about the mergers, you know, the international mergers of the stock exchanges. Including Toronto, London, and so on. Exactly. Right, right. Well, the volumes have been down in general, as I said, in the last couple of years, because the average person has been less engaged in these markets. And the, the clients, if you will, have become these high frequency trading shops as the primary clients, the primary users of something that's meant to be a utility of a free and open society. So it's again, they've subverted the banking system and now you know the stock market and the rest of us are supposed to just, oh well, no problem, we'll use it anyway, it's all good. Meanwhile, you know, it's quicksand that can vanish in an instant and we're not supposed to worry about that. We promised you opinions on today's program, didn't we? We're back with more after this. The Money and Wealth Show is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Looking to advertise to targeted audiences? Online at talkdigitalnetwork.com or howstreet.com. On television, The Money and Wealth Show. And on radio, This Week in Money. To learn more about getting your message in front of our audiences, email us, info at howstreet.com, or call us, 604-699-8600. You're watching The Money and Wealth Show, archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Here's your host, Sterling Fox. Danielle, thanks so much for being with us. It's a pleasure to have you back on the show. And again, jugglingdynamite.com, a great place to visit. Our thanks to Fritz and the gang here at Churchill's at the Holiday Inn in North Vancouver for the hospitality. And for the Money and Wealth Show, I'm Sterling Fox. See you next time. The Money and Wealth Show has been brought to you by AmericanManganeseInc.com.